sing with us. So praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing. Your name. 
your spirit. By your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting. Doug, come. Amen. Well, I want to offer you greetings on this Resurrection Sunday. I'm glad that you could join us uh, in worship this morning. And uh, we're still separated by distance, but together in the Spirit. Um, I wanted to uh, just say I'm happy to be able to worship uh, during this Holy Week on some special occasions uh, with you. And um, to be able to celebrate uh, communion on Thursday and to be together on Good Friday uh, was great. We will be uh, taking communion together later on in this service. So if you have uh, those elements or you can um, get those, I uh, want to make sure you are aware of that. As we start uh, this morning, I want to read from John chapter 11. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who will come, who has come into the world. Jesus once more moved, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. And then Jesus said, Did I not tell you if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much to be able to celebrate this morning your resurrection and God, what that means for us and our ultimate resurrection. God, that anyone who believes in you lives and will never die. We thank you so much. Pray that you would send your spirit to be with us now and in this service, uh, that we may hear from your voice, that we may touch your heart, and God, that you may touch our hearts. We thank you so much. In Jesus' powerful name, amen. Uh, as a way of a couple announcements, I um, wanted to let you know that we are going to be continuing uh, our Sunday school and our Wednesday night Bible studies via Zoom. And that information is going out in weekly email updates. Um, if you uh, aren't getting those emails and you'd like to be able to get those, you can uh, give us your contact information. Um, you don't feel like you have to put that in the chat box where everyone can see it necessarily. You can send the church a, a private Facebook message and we'll be able to add you to those lists. We also do calls to update people. Um, and if you want your phone number to be a part of that, please let us know so we can be in contact with you, let you know what is going on in uh, these times. Uh, the church staff wanted to let you know that we are available to you uh, in this time. Even though we're separated, if there's things that we can pray with you about, obviously you can put those prayer requests in the, uh, in the chat feature there. Um, but you can also send a message. Uh, and we're going to be putting, uh, right now someone's putting our contact information for the staff. Uh, so you can reach out to us in the chat feature there. Um, and so we wanted to let you know uh, that we are available and make sure you have ways to get a hold of us uh, in this time. Uh, also, we are archiving our services um, on our church website, marionfirst.com. So if you want to be able to go back and um, see those services again, uh, we will have those on the website within uh, a day or two, usually, of our, um, of our services uh, so that they're there to archive. Uh, I hope that's right because I just put Brandon on the spot. So, um, Oh, by the way, I just want to thank Brandon for all that he's done with us and for us to be able to worship together. This technology has been our, our point person, so just wanted to let you know that, uh, that Pastor Brandon has been uh, kind of leading the charge in that. We thank him for what he's been doing with that. Uh, as a way of exchanging greetings this morning, obviously you can greet in your household or wherever you're at worshiping. Uh, we also would like that you would put uh, some greeting messages in the chat box. Let us know you're here. Um, so that um, we can um, just see who is, who is here, who we can make sure we're being in contact with. We can greet one another in that way as well. So. As we continue our worship, um, there's a traditional greeting or acclamation that is uh, used on Easter, and uh, I think it would be great if you went out on your front porch and did this at some point today. I don't know, but uh, I've heard a lot of cool things that are happening around the country in different communities. Uh, my brother lives in New York City and, and uh, shared an article uh, about how churches are coming out uh, 
uh, opening their windows and singing Christ the Lord is Risen Today on mm -hmm. Easter Sunday morning. Uh, but this traditional Easter acclamation is just a call and response thing uh, that you've done before if you've been at church on an Easter Sunday, at least with me, uh, where we say Christ is risen and we respond, He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Let's try that two more times. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen indeed. indeed. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Amen. I'm ready. Ready? Count up. Yeah. One, two, three.
He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. Amen. Let's continue our worship as Pastor Corey comes to bring the message this morning. Thank you for singing in your homes and worshiping with us in this way. What a beautiful day to celebrate our risen Savior. Uh, Today's passage is going to be from John chapter 11. And uh, we will actually, we'll be going through a lot of different passages. And it occurred to me last week that there's some pretty unique things we can do with Facebook Live. And so uh, you can, if you'd like, get your Bible out in front of you and follow along with me. Or I'm going to have someone uh, post the links and copy and paste the, or not the links, but copy and paste the verses in the chat so that you can follow along with us. Um, As we talk about this resurrection, on this Resurrection Sunday, I want to uh, first start off by talking to you about authority. Uh, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of authority. A few things that come to my mind, I think of a boss, for example, Um, I think of uh, I think of our nation's leaders. Uh, they certainly have authority. I think of perhaps even things like words have authority. So we believe that the scripture has authority and the things that the scripture says has authority. Uh, I also believe, you know, like laws, for example, they have authority. We have policemen, they have authority. So we live in a world where people have authority all around us. And uh, there's, in, in a sense, there can be a hierarchy of, of authority Um, But I think of authority in a lot of different ways. Uh, For myself, I think of authority, especially with my parents uh, or me as a parent. uh, But I remember even when I was in high school, I was one out of all of my brothers. I was one of the only ones who my parents required a curfew of me. And uh, which the reason for that is not because I was like a bad kid or anything. In fact, it was when I was here at church. Uh, and some of the things that I would, I just was one of those got, kids that just, I, I lost track of time. I enjoyed, I had fun with the things I was doing and I would constantly, and, and really like the main people I hung out with were the youth group. And so, uh, the things that I would get in trouble for was just staying out past 11 PM, uh, because I was out playing, you know, doing bowling with the, you know, the youth group or something like that. And I didn't pay attention to time. Right. And so my parents gave me a curfew. Uh, so they had authority and in a sense they had an authority over me and in giving me, you know, telling me things that I needed to do, giving me boundaries. And so there is a parental authority. Even with my own kids, I think of Aiden, for example, if I didn't give parental authority or direction towards my kids, just think of the, the mayhem that would, you know, happen in our house. My son for sure would eat probably only ever eat macaroni and cheese if there was no parental authority in my house, right? Uh, or candy. That would be the second thing. I mean, he's loves, he loves anything sweet or anything with pasta. Or then again, I also think of my, my daughter, Riley. She's at the age where, and I don't understand, but how kids, they, they always seem to latch on to like light sockets at her age. She's, you know, about 10, 11 months. And so the, just, it's like it draws her. And so there is a sense in which there is a parental authority that I have to protect my daughter from danger. I think it was just this last week, my family watched the movie A Bug's Life. So maybe, you know, we've got a lot of parents here. Um, So many of us maybe have seen that movie. But do you remember the the scene where the bug starts going toward the bug bug zapper and the the other bug's like, don't go near the light, (laughs) right? I feel like that with my kids all the time, right? I always do. I'm always telling my kids, ah, don't go near the light, you know, telling my daughter, don't go near the light sockets. But you realize that God has given me as a parent authority over my kids 
both for directions and boundaries and protection for my kids. So there's, there's not necessarily anything wrong or evil about authority. In fact, I think authority is something that God has created within our world, and it is, it is a way to protect, and it is meant to be a good thing. But unfortunately, I'm sure each and every one of us can think of moments in our lives where authority has been, a, has been used in a negative way. And authority can be misused, uh, power can be misused, there can be abuse of power, but Authority itself, there's nothing wrong with authority. Uh, I think of, even in the scriptures, all throughout the scriptures, you see this concept of, of authority. And um, even in the Gospels, in fact, when you read the Gospels, there, of course, there's four Gospels, but each Gospels, while they tell the same story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, uh, each of the Gospels focus in on a different uh, undertone or theme within their gospel. So John's gospel, for instance, focuses on Jesus being the light in the darkness or being life, the life of the world or the light of the world. But when you read Mark's gospel, Mark's gospel is all about the authority of the Son of God and that he has authority and he's been given ultimate authority. In fact, when you read the first few chapters of Mark's gospel, it starts off right at the beginning where it shows that Jesus has authority over all sorts of different, uh, different things. For example, you have Jesus has authority over the de demonic realm. And he, you see that because he casts out the spirit. You also see that he has authority over the physical realm because he goes and he heals many people. And he heals the sick, and so he has authority over the physical realm. We also see that Jesus has authority over impurity. Uh, and you see that because Jesus heals a man with leprosy, which was a sign of impurity. Uh, and then finally, you see that Jesus in Mark's gospel, the first few chapters, that Jesus has ultimate authority over the spiritual realm. And you see that because he has authority to forgive sins. So you see that authority is something that Jesus had, and he had authority over heaven and earth, over all things. So authority is not a bad thing. Now, what I want to do is I want to trace for a moment, uh, as we get to this, this conclusion of this resurrection, but I want to trace with you throughout the scriptures this idea of authority, where it came from, how it developed through the scriptures, and I think we can do it with just a couple of passages. So if you have your Bibles, and if you don't have your Bibles, I'm going to have someone link this in the, in the, uh, in the page. It's going to be Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Now this is right at the beginning of creation. And we often focus on verse 26 and verse 27, where it says that we were created in the image of God and the image of God, God created us, which is a beautiful concept. But I want to look at the verse directly after that in verse 28. This is what it says. When he creates you and I, he says, God blessed them and said, meaning them being us, you and I, said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. So you see in that passage in verse 28, when God created us, the language is that we were to subdue the earth, that we were given this rule or this authority over creation. That when God created the world, he created it innately with this authority or this ruling or subduing, and that we had a responsibility towards creation to protect, to guide, to nurture. And so this, this concept of authority begins very early. Now, then you realize in chapter 3, there's the fall of mankind, and I think that there's something that happens with creation that uh, damages creation. And so, uh, if you have your Bibles, flip over to uh, Luke chapter 4, and in Luke chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, I'm going to flip there myself, and I think this gives us a sense for what happened in 
the temptation scene. So Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 5 and 6. It's, this is the temptation of Jesus, and the devil is tempting Jesus, and this is what the devil says. The devil led him to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in an instant. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me. If you, were, if, if you worship me, all of this will be yours. So you see, the devil takes Jesus on a high place and he says, all of this authority has been given to me. Now, I struggled with that at first because I, at first I thought, well, where did the devil get all of his authority? And my first thought was, did, or my first question was, did God give him that authority? I don't believe that God gave the devil any authority whatsoever. Just to begin with, that just doesn't make sense. Why would God give the devil authority? I don't think that's what happened. I think what happens is the devil stands and he looks out among the kingdoms of the world and all of their splendor, and he says, all of the authority, when Adam and Eve sinned, all of the authority that they had, that they were given in the garden, that that authority was given to me, and the devil says, I can give it to whomever I wish. So I don't believe that God gave him authority, but what I, what I believe is that we gave the enemy authority in our lives, and that's what we did. We gave up our power, and we gave it to the enemy. Now, tracing that with our final passage is in Colossians chapter 2, uh, verse 15. And uh, I've read this quite a number of times. It's one of my favorite verses. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 13. When you were all dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave our sins, having canceled the written code which which we were indebted to, which stood against us and condemned us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. See, what he says is that Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities. Whatever power and authority that the devil had or the enemy had, that when Jesus died on a cross and resurrected from the grave, he removed or disarmed all the powers of the enemy, the authority that, they, that, that he might have had. In fact, you see it because in John's gospel, it says that darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour covered over all the land. And the imagery is that the enemy, when Jesus is about to give his life on, a cro- on the cross, that the enemy is going to bring all that he has to bear, all darkness itself. And he's going to take his worst weapon, the worst weapon that he has in his arsenal, which is death itself, and he's going to bring it to, the, to Jesus in this moment. But you and I know the completion of the story, that Jesus gives up his life, and that three days later, that life or light itself is going to overcome the darkness. See, Jesus fulfills the prophecy that, that John states already in, Je- in John chapter 1, verse 4, where it says that light has come into the world, but darkness will never overcome the light. See, Jesus was the victor. Now, as we settle in our passage in John chapter 11, uh, this is, of course, this, this is not the resurrection passage of Jesus, but this is the resurrection of Lazarus from the grave, which is a precursor to what's going to take place during Holy Week. It's a precursor. It's a glimpse inside of what's just what's soon going to take place with Jesus' own resurrection. And so in chapter 11, uh, you see that Jesus gets this news that Lazarus is sick. Now, first of all, you know that there's not been a single moment where anyone has ever died in the presence of Jesus. Now, there's been a lot of people who have been sick or have been near death, but whenever Jesus shows up on the scene, Jesus has, it, from any place you can find in Scripture, Jesus always heals the people that, people that he comes across. 
And so, of course, Martha reaches out to Jesus, and Jesus finds out that Lazarus is on the brink of death. And intentionally, Jesus postpones his journey to see Lazarus. And he does it intentionally because God is going to show, Jesus is going to show his glory through resurrecting Lazarus. And so then Jesus finally, after, after a few days, he makes the trip to Bethany. And it's also important to note that this is taking place in Bethany, which was only two miles from Jerusalem, which means it was on the doorstep of the same place that Jesus is about to give up his life and where he's going to go to a grave. And it's as if he's showing the whole world and all of the Jews what, a, what is about to take place. And so, of course, Jesus shows up in four days. Lazarus has been in the grave. And Jesus, in verse 43, says, as he looks into the grave, he calls out into the grave, calls out into the darkness, and he says, Lazarus, come out. Now, I think the imagery here is really profound. Because Jesus is looking into a tomb, which would, have been full, which would have been all darkness, and he's looking into a tomb, and he looks into death, and as he, 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 as he speaks into it, he commands death itself to die in Lazarus. That when he speaks into Lazarus, speaks into death itself, he commands it to die, and then he commands Lazarus to come from the tomb, and as Lazarus emerges from the tomb, death itself must remain, because this is light itself. This is Jesus Christ, who is life himself, calling Lazarus from the grave. And so Lazarus steps out, and in the passage it says in verse 44, that when he comes out, Lazarus still has all of these grave clothes on him. And then Jesus tells them to remove the grave clothes in verse 44, take off the grave clothes and let him go. See, even when Jesus speaks into death and commands death to die and calls Lazarus forth and the grave clothes, which would have had the stench of death, he says, even the stench of death, remove that itself. And they remove the clothes. Can you think there was a moment in your life where Jesus looked into, your, looked into you and you were death itself, that you were in the grave and he reaches into darkness, into the grave itself and he commands death, the death that was in you, he commands death itself to die and he pulls you from the grave and that you might have had the grave clothes but Jesus tells, tells the people to remove the grave clothes from your life because Jesus, you are not going to have the stench of death on you anymore. That this is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that he gives each and every one of you and I. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, in verse 25, right before Jesus is going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead, Jesus tells Martha who he really is. And he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. He says, do you believe this? So my question to you is, do you believe in that sort of a resurrection from the dead? Where Jesus can look into your life, to a life even when it was, when it was once dead, that he can reach into your life and he can command death itself to die. That he can look into your life and he can call, he can call darkness to flee and that you can be removed from the grave and experience, experience this life. You know, I believe in such a very optimistic faith. And, I, and as a Nazarene church, we really hold to a very optimistic faith. And it's not to say that we struggle. We certainly do. It's not to say we're perfect, at least in the sense that you and I would think of perfection. I, I realize that we make mistakes. I realize that there are times that we can fall short. I realize that. I realize that there's struggle. I realize that there can be a battle. But you realize we believe in, a, in an, op, we have an optimistic faith. And what that means is Jesus Christ has already won the victory. That when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave, that he literally broke the power of sin. That sin no longer has power in your life. 
because Jesus has called you from the grave, that sin itself no longer has authority, that the enemy no longer has authority. If he ever once did had authority that you and I gave him, that when Jesus died and resurrected from the dead, that power or that authority of sin has been broken. And you remember when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the other thing that happened was that the, temp, the, the, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And that separation that you and I once had between us and God was now removed and we were granted full access to the Father. The beauty of what this resurrection means. See, I believe in, in what the scripture says when it says that Jesus or that, not Jesus, but that we will never be tempted, because Jesus doesn't tempt, but that we will never be tempted beyond what you and I can bear. Because we are living in this resurrection power. You know, I used to think that um, before we met Jesus, before I met Jesus, that there is a sense in which that throughout my life I've, I, I had all this gunk, um, I had darkness, I had death, that just kind of piled on me, that the enemy had a hold in my life. Before I was a Christian, he had a hold on my life, and that there were all these grave clothes, if, in a sense, that, was, that, were, that I was wrapped in, and that I was, I was restricted, and I, I, I had all of this gunk on me. And I just believe that because of all of that stuff that was piled on, because of the death that was inside of me, that I never really experienced who God created me to be. What I've discovered over the years, that since I've known Jesus, that what Jesus has done is he's been removing the grave clothes in my life, that he has been removing that gunk, he's been removing the darkness, he's been removing that which is not him, and that as he removes that, I'm discovering more and more who God created me to be. I'm discovering who I really am. And I realize that before I knew Jesus, I never was who I really was meant to be. That God is literally, he is removing that which, which does not belong in my life and replacing it with that which does belong, which is Jesus. I want to think, as we come to a close once more, I want to think for a moment regarding the church. I believe that the church has, is living in victory and walking in victory and that we're walking in, in, in the reality that the battle has already been fought and that we don't have to fight the new battle, that we just have to live in the battle that's already been won when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave. I've seen a lot of, especially with this pandemic going on, I've seen a lot of um, negativity toward the church, or not just toward the church, but the church itself, the negativity of the church, and especially with Easter Sunday, that a lot of people have said, you know, the church is really struggling. I don't believe the church is struggling. I, uh, I think it was Faye Turnbull. Uh, it was, I think it was Wednesday night Bible study. She said she saw something that I think is really incredible. She said that uh, all over the world, all over the world, that our churches are going to be empty, that our pews are going to be empty on Easter Sunday of all Sundays. But what she read was, not only where, will our pews be empty, but so was the tomb. And in the same sense, Jesus, the tomb has been, the tomb is emptied. And we are living with the battle that's already been won. We are living in victory. And the only way to embrace that victory, or the only way to embrace that life, is to come to Jesus. Because that's what Jesus says. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to, take communion. And I think it's so fitting that we take communion, especially on Easter, because the only way to experience that resurrection power is to have communion and to take communion with, with Jesus and to be in communion with Jesus. Now, many of you may have already found out, or maybe you've sensed it already, but because of some of the issues, the technical difficulties we had early on, we've decided to go to this format where we record the services on on Friday, and we premiere it on Sunday. And, uh, and it does still say Facebook Live, and I sense it as a, as a live event, and that's what we want it to feel like to you. 
but I want to say that because when we take communion, communion is a communal thing. It's a community thing. And if it isn't a community thing, it just isn't communion. And so while I am going to bless the elements and I'm going to lead us as a church in communion, because it's only me, I'm not going to take communion myself because that wouldn't be communion. I'm going to be taking communion with you on Sunday morning as we, as we participate in the person of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ. So if you have a moment, go make sure you grab some bread. And I do encourage you, uh, it doesn't have to be unleavened bread, but it should be some, some form of, of uh, bread from the store. Um, we do ask that you don't use junk food. Uh, that wouldn't be appropriate for this because this is still a very sacred act. And there's something that communion, it actually means something spiritual. Um, so we're not casual with this and we're not flippant with this. This is something very important. So grab some bread, grab some juice. If you don't have juice, you, you do have permission to use some form of uh, water as a, as a substitute for juice. But this is going to represent Jesus' body and his blood as he died for us and what that means in the resurrection, resurrected Christ. So if you would grab those, I would like to pray over the elements as we bless them and as we take them together. Jesus, we believe that even though we are not physically in one space, that your spirit can bring us together in this act of communion. That in this moment, even though we can't see each other next to each other, next to one another, that you can bring us together so that there is a sense that we as a church are taking this together as a church, as a community. So I ask that you would, you would be in this uh, bread and in this juice as your body and your blood. And Jesus, if we want to experience this resurrection power, the only way we experience it is by experiencing and partaking and participating in you, in Jesus Christ. Jesus, be with us as we take this communion. Bless the elements. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'd ask you to take the bread and take the juice and take it as I read. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread and eat? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you take the cup? And in taking the elements, it is, it is the prayer of my heart is that each and every one of us would participate, would jump all in, would say, Jesus, I just want more of you. Jesus, I want, the, I want a Jesus that, was, that had been, has been resurrected. And if you're at home and you're viewing in on this and, and you're saying, I don't know this resurrected Christ. I don't know a Christ that with, with such power. I don't know this victory. I don't know this. If you're sitting at home and you're saying, I have not experienced a Jesus who would call me from the grave, who would call me and literally tell death to die, and you say, I don't know that Jesus, I want to invite you this morning that you can accept and you can embrace that Jesus this morning. I would encourage you that if you, if you are praying and if you do want to accept that Jesus, that you can reach out to us as pastors. You can reach out to me. You can send a, face, send a Facebook message on, on, uh, on Marion First. 
because I want each and every one of you to experience a Jesus that I know so personally in my life, a Jesus who has won the battle. I want you to know a Jesus who has brought life to death, has brought life, light to darkness. Would you know that Jesus with me? We're going to sing. Would you join us as we sing? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus, he came to love, heal and forgive, he bled and died, to buy my pardon, an empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living. Just because he lives because I know because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives man I'm going to invite the team back up to join me as we uh, end with one more response song that we want to sing to proclaim the resurrection. And we invite you to find these words on the the service sheet that we provided. Uh, The lyrics should be there, uh, easy enough to find online as well. But uh, as Michael and Dan uh, join us back, and then Corey will close us out with, uh, or is Doug closing? Corey's closing. Okay. Closing out with a final prayer and benediction as we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. But let's continue to sing. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the lie of inward shame, but fix our eyes up. On the cross and run to him who should great love and let for us freely you let for us Christ is risen from the dead trampling over death by death come awake come awake come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. 
Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I will be with you always, even to the very ends of the age. Isn't that incredible? Jesus has authority over all things in heaven and on earth. Jesus has won the victory. Would you pray with me as we close? Jesus, we want to live in your resurrected power. You, you have won the battle. Jesus, could we walk in that victory? Death, where is your sting? Jesus, you have won. Jesus, be with us as we pray the prayer that you once taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week. Did anybody spot our little Easter friend? You want to go get it? Go get it. <laughs> this is the special features on the DVD of the, the Easter eggs, the outtakes. We had, we had a little, we had a little, we had a little friend that was, that was. There'll be one every week. Watch for it. Here. This is not brought to you. This is not brought to you by Starbucks right here. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's a wrap. Wait, how many of these do you have now? <laughs>